everyone and welcome to EAG Church Online. My name is Dean and it is so amazing to have you joining us today. If you're just tuning in, feel free to leave us a comment telling us who you're watching with and where you're watching from. Or if you've got something more personal and serious to share, you put that in the comments as well. Or you can message us privately, either social media or our website www.eagrm.org. Just drop us a line and we'll connect with you right away. Now the service is just about ready to begin, so why don't you grab a Bible in one hand and a cool bottle of water in the other and let's get ready for another great weekend of online church. Through the shadow, your love surrounds me. There's nothing to fear now, for I am safe with you. So when I fight, I'll fight on my knees with my hands lifted high. Oh God, the battle belongs to you And every fear I lay at your feet And I'll sing through the night Oh God, the battle belongs to you And if you are for me, who can be against me? For Jesus, there's nothing impossible for you. When all I see are the ashes, you see the beauty. When all I see is a cross, God, you see the empty tomb. So when I find before us nothing can stand against the power of our God you shine in the shadows you win every battle nothing can stand against the power of our God an almighty fortress you go before us nothing can stand against the power of our God you shine in the shadows, you win every battle. Nothing can stand against the power of our God. In almighty fortress, you go before us. Nothing can stand against the power of our God. You shine in the shadows, you win every battle. Nothing can stand against the power of our God. So when I fight, I'll fight on my knees with my hands lifted high. Oh God, the battle belongs to you. And every fear I lay at your feet and I'll sing through the night. Oh God, the battle belongs to you. Oh God, the battle belongs to you. Oh, 
Well, again, everybody, glad to have you with us here as we continue our series on the book of Revelation, the last book in the Bible, a dynamic book that uh, tells us about the last times. Since I was a kid, you know, we've always had this fascination with space, and, uh, and so I've always seen all the Apollo rockets and all that, and, you know, there, with all that happened, there's been this tremendous interest with literature and film and all these things and movies about, known as science fiction. And I, and I love science fiction. I used to watch a lot of those type of movies and things. And one of the blockbuster movies a long time ago from outer space was a little creature named E.T. Some of you might be, be too young to have known that, but it was there. When I was a kid, one of the shows that I would watch regularly was Star Trek. I used to love to see what Captain Kirk and the crew would, would face each time and the different kind of creatures they would meet in all the planets. And then, then there's just been fascination with the possibility that, that we might get an invasion from outer space. In fact, in 1938, a famous incident took place involving the actor Orson Welles. He was narrating a part in the play, The War of the Worlds, over radio. And unsuspecting listeners would tune in at different parts of the broadcast, not realizing that it was just play acting, but they believed that the state of New Jersey was being invaded by Martians. So realistic was the actor's portrayal, it almost sent an entire nation into panic that they thought they were being invaded by Martians. Ironically, the Bible teaches that someday a worldwide invasion is going to take place, but it won't be an invasion from outer space. It's going to be an invasion from inner space. There's going to be unleashed an army of demon locusts and of 200 million satanic soldiers who will do battle with the forces of earth. It will truly be a war of the worlds. And I just want to take that caption of a couple moves that have been put out and, and title my message this morning, The War of the Worlds. Now, it will we'll see more people killed than all the other wars in human history in these last days. So today we're going to read a descriptive picture of war that we have laid out for us in the book of Revelation. But, but I want to warn you as we get into this, it's going to be depressing, it's going to be demoralizing. You're going to see horror and hurt and heartache and heartbreak on an unprecedented scale like the world has never seen before. And so as we continue to move through the book of Revelation, we keep seeing all of these uh, many series of sevens. In, in chapters 2 and 3, we saw the letters to the seven churches. Last week, we saw how God's judgment has been wrapped up in a seven-sealed scroll. The first six seals have been broken. We looked at that last week, and we saw war and death and destruction and calamity on an unprecedented scale. Those on the earth during that time will think, surely the end has come, but it has not because now we're getting ready to open the seventh seal, and there's going to be ushered into a period of judgments produced with seven trumpets. Then with the seven trumpets blown, there's going to be seven bowls of even greater judgment that's going to be poured upon on this earth. So just a, a couple things here. The seven seals give us a picture of a world that's ruined by man. The seven trumpet judgments are going to tell us about a world ruled by Satan. And then the seven bowls that we'll get to most likely next week will tell us about a world that's rescued by God. So go with me to the book of Revelation chapter 8, and let's get started with verse number 1. When he opened the seventh scroll, there was silence in heaven for about half an hour. Now, now this is an amazing verse right here, because normally when you hear anything about heaven, there, there's worship around the throne, there's singing, there's praise, there's rejoicing, but now all the heavenly choirs are still, the harps cease, the angels are not singing, the, the four living creatures are not saying holy, holy, holy. There was, si there was silence in heaven. I believe that this is like the calm before storm. You know, the lightning crashes, it crackles across the sky, and then there's silence, and then boom, the thunder hits. You've been in those type of storms. I remember several years ago when I was in the Air Force over, overseas in Spain, and we were doing an exercise. And uh, our guys were out there uh, working on the flight line, fixing some airplanes, and all of a sudden, a simulated attack came upon us, and these fighter jets flew low over the deck. I mean, just Boom, went go right over our head, and we saw them, and, but we didn't hear anything. I mean, they were, so they were going supersonic when they went past us, and then a couple seconds later, all the rolling thunder just followed. And I mean, it was deafening that there was no sound that these fighters normally make, but all that sound followed them afterwards. Well, here we have a half an hour where there's silence in heaven. Now, that might not seem like a long time, but think about it. It's a deafening experience. 30 minutes is a long time. You take a man proposing marriage to his girlfriend, and she stands there and just looks at him for 30 minutes. That, that guy is falling apart on the inside. He doesn't know what's going to happen. 
Think of a courtroom where a man is on trial for his life. The jury comes out. Uh, the judge asks the foreman, have you reached a verdict? The foreman says, we have. The judge says, what is it? Then just imagine silence for 30 minutes. He says, uh, he doesn't say anything. All heaven is frozen in awe of what they are seeing. The final chapter of time as we know it is about to be revealed. And we get a glimpse of that, you know, here in the book of Revelation. So it's like Zephaniah said in chapter 1, verse 7, Be silent before the sovereign Lord, for the day of the Lord is near. So the seven trumpets are about to sound. These are not worship trumpets. It's too late for worship. These are not work trumpets, for the night is come and no man can work. These are not war trumpets. For, th these are war trumpets, for God has now declared war on the world because they have rejected his son Jesus Christ, even though they've been given so many chances. So let's look. Revelation chapter 8. I'll read verse 1 again and then 2 and 3. When he opened the seventh seal, there was silence in heaven for about half an hour. And I saw the seven angels who stand before God, and seven trumpets were given to them. Another angel who had a golden censer came and stood at the altar. He was given much incense to offer with the prayers of all God's people on the golden altar in front of the throne. So a censer is what holds the incense, and the incense in the Bible we've talked about a couple weeks ago is a symbol of prayer and intersection. And notice that this censer right here contains the prayers of all God's people. And then it says in verse 4 and 5, the smoke of the incense together with the prayers of God's people went up before God from the angel's hand. Then the angel took the censer, filled it with fire from the altar, and hurled it on the earth. And there came peals of thunder, rumblings, flashes of lightning, and an earthquake. So when the heavenly timeout ends, we, we, and it does it with a bang, what, what, what an amazing visual in my mind of the power of prayer. You know, never stop praying. Prayer works. At the end of this half hour, when the prayer ascends, God's judgment descends. So the altar is not only a place of sacrifice, just so you know, but it's also a place of judgment. When God sacrificed his son on the altar of the cross, his judgment also fell on Jesus. We've talked about this almost every week. God's fire always falls on the altar of the sacrifice. And if you accept the sacrifice, you avoid the judgment. But if you reject the sacrifice, then you're going to have to receive the judgment. We learn in Hebrews chapter 10, it says, If we deliberately keep on sinning after we have received knowledge of the truth, no sacrifice for sins is left but only a fearful expectation of judgment and of enraging fire that will consume the enemies of God. So keep in mind that God's judgment is being poured out upon this earth, not because of what the earth has done, so to speak, but because of what the earth has not done. Some people think that people go to hell because they do bad things. If someone goes to hell, it's not because of what they did, but rather because of what they failed to do. They failed to receive Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior. <coughs> now, there are some, as we get into these judgments, <coughs> that, uh, that don't think they're literal judgments upon the earth. They just think, well, this is just kind of a imaginary or allegory or something. But I, I believe that they are real for three reasons. First, because of the words of Jesus. In Luke 21, he said, there will be signs in the sun moon and stars on the earth, nations will be in anguish and perplexity at the roaring and tossing of the sea. People will faint from terror, apprehensive of what is coming on the world, for the heavenly bodies will be shaken. So Jesus also talks about these things in Matthew chapter 24. Secondly, I believe these are little judgments because we have the witness of the Bible. Way back in Isaiah chapter 13, verses 9 and 10 say, that, See, the day of the Lord is coming, a cruel day, with wrath and fierce anger, to make the land desolate and destroy the sinners within it. The stars of heaven and their constellations will not show light. The rising sun will be dark and the moon will not give its light. And so we have the words of Jesus, the witness of the Bible. And third, we, there's also the wickedness of, Isaiah, of man. Isaiah chapter uh, 13, but going to verse 11, one verse beyond what I just read says, uh, will punish the world for its evil, the wicked for their sins. I will not, I will put an end to the arrogance of the haughty and will humble the pride of the ruthless. So we see, in, in my mind, three good reasons why I think these will be literal judgments. Now, when the trumpets begin to blow, we see a different type of destruction that takes place on the earth. So let me tell you these. Number one, we see a fiery storm. A fiery storm. Verse 7. 
The first angel sounded his trumpet, and there came hail and fire mixed with blood, and it was hurled down on the earth. A third of the earth was burned up, a third of the trees were burned up, and all the green grass was burned up. Now, today when we hear about forest fires, you know, we, we always hear about how many miles it got burned up or how many acres. But when this first trumpet sounds, the damage is going to be measured in countries, maybe even continents, because it's going to be so massive. The ecology of the earth will be turned upside down. Economic collapse will ensue, along with food shortages, massive property damage from the fires. If we just limited, you know, this destruction to America, imagine one-third of America's forests on fire. One-third of those waves of grain you know, gone. One third of the fruited plain becoming a parched desert. Fire spreading all over the earth. A third of the wheat fields. A third of the rice fields. A third of the oat fields in this earth. Ecological disaster. Now think about how this would affect the food supply. Furthermore, all the pasture lands that would be destroyed. So, uh, you know, that would affect the meat and the milk production. Think of the pungent smoke and the air pollution that would come. Think again of how many birds of the air and beasts of the field would die as well. The balance of our ecological system, which many today worship, by the way, would be destroyed. And so what we have here is a picture of a world that has rejected Christ, the bread of life. And now people probably can't even make bread because one third of all the vegetation is destroyed. Secondly, we see the filthy sea. Verses 8 and 9. The second angel sounded his trump, and something like a huge mountain all ablaze was thrown into the sea. A third of the sea turned into blood, a third of the living creatures in the sea died, and a third of the ships were destroyed. So the second trumpet is going to bring salt water devastation. Massive poison burning something will be thrown into the sea. It could be a meteor or the contents of a volcanic eruption. We, we're not told exactly. Whatever it is, we know that it is not just a natural disaster. The fact is that it is thrown means that someone had to throw it. The resulting tsunami will be large enough to overturn, sink, or carry far onto shore a third of all the ships. In 2016, the number of ships on the ocean at any given time was around 50,000. So that means that nearly 17,000 ships and their crews will be destroyed with this one cataclysmic event. The damage to supply lines will be irreparable. But what's significant is not just the size of the Great Mount, but its composition. There's something about it that will cause the sea to turn to blood and one third of all the sea life to be destroyed. Fishing companies will have to close their doors. The economies of many coastal communities will implode. The world will be reeling. Fish will, will, will die in, in record numbers. Now, if one third of the ships were to be destroyed, the maritime industry would be in total chaos. You know, the, the battleships of, of the world's armies, was, a lot of those would be gone. Oil spills would be all over the place. They would look like an ink blot, what we, what, you know, compared, the, what we had before looked like an ink blot, but compared to, to this mess. Beaches would be liberated with bodies and fish and ships washing up on shore. The Bible says, without the shedding of blood, there's no remission of sin. When Jesus died on the cross and the blood that he shed, every drop represented the sacrifice of his life for the sins of the world. But a Christ-rejecting world, like what's happening here, they basically say, we don't want that old blood religion. And so look what they get. They, they get a reminder with all this blood of the blood of Jesus. They're being reminded. Thirdly, we see the fallen star. The third angel sounded his trumpet, this is verses 10 and 11, and a great star blazing like a torch fell from the sky and a third of the rivers and on the springs of water, the name of the star is Wormwood. A third of the waters turned bitter and many people died from the waters that had become bitter. So for some reason, somehow God sets aside this special star to carry out this judgment. He has given the star the name of Wormwood. It's a plant found in Palestine, by the way. Horticulturists tell us that the wormwood is among the most bitter tasting plants on earth. And when this star falls into the fresh waters of the world, the rivers and the streams and the lakes become so bitter to the taste that they cannot be consumed. Knowing that the water compromises 65% of the human body, you can see the havoc and the chaos that would come just by the pollution of so much drinking water. Now, this points me to a fact that Jesus said he's the water of life. You know, come to him and drink of the living water, he invites us, and be saved. So, but this is a world that rejects the water of life, and so they're going to have to drink the bitter water of judgment and sin, okay? Fourthly, we have the falling, we have the failing sun, okay? The failing sun, verse 12, the fourth angel sounded his trumpet, and a third of the sun was struck, 
a third of the moon and a third of the stars, so that a third of them turned dark, a third of the day was without light, and also a third of the night. I don't think I have to go into detail to tell you the ecological effects that, could, that are going to happen because of this. I heard about a science teacher who asked the class this question. Which is more important to us, the moon or the sun? A little boy said, well, the moon, of course. The teacher said, why? The little boy said, because the moon gives us light at night when we need it. The sun gives us light in the daytime when we don't need it. Well, obviously, this kid doesn't realize that it's the sun that always gives us light, that the moon just is a re re reflecting the sun that it gets. And so without the power and the heat and the light of the sun, we could not grow vegetables and fruit and grain and food to feed us and to sustain us. With the, with the sun dim like this, I mean, think of the cold. Think of, you know, we've heard so much about global warming, but we're talking about an, another ice age possibly coming in. Why is it that only one third of the earth and the sky is affected in these judgments? Why is it that the judgment of God is limited here? I mean, come on, God, if you're going to destroy it, just go ahead and get it done. Why doesn't he let loose and just get it over with? Well, I'll tell you why. Because as God oversees all of this with a firm hand, he also has a broken heart. 2 Peter 3, 9 says, The Lord is not slow in keeping his promise, as some understand slowness. Instead, he is patient with you, not wanting anyone to perish, but everyone to come to repentance. So we, we have to understand that about God. He, he's giving people time to repent, even in, in this situation. The Bible says that here the sun and the moon and the stars will be dim. But when you get to Revelation chapter 16, we read, And the fourth angel poured out his bowl upon the sun, and power was given unto him to scorch men with, pyre, pyre, with, with fire. So, so in this case, it's going to be dim. But in chapter 16, it's going to be turned up. So God can turn his light source up or down. He's in control. So we are living in a world where Jesus Christ came 2,000 years ago. When Jesus came, he said, I'm the light of the world. But the Bible says that men love darkness rather than light. And they turn their backs on the light of the world, the Lord Jesus Christ. And so God says to a world that didn't want light, all right, you didn't want light, I'll take the light away. And so they're going to have to deal with that, whatever the re repercussions will be. You know, as I thought about all these judgments coming, these, these four that I just read about, I thought back to the children of Israel in Egypt and Pharaoh. I thought of the 10 plagues that come upon him. And, and, and if you remember that, and if you study that, those 10 plagues, you know, represented, you know, what Egypt worshipped. And, and I look at this and I think, you know what? The, these plagues that are coming, they are mocking the people of the world and what they worship nowadays. When you think about all the things that they worship, that they rejected Christ. Verse 13 says this, as I watched, I heard an angel, I heard an eagle that was flying in the midair call out in a loud voice, whoa. Woe, woe to the inhabitants of the earth because of the trumpet blast about to be sounded by the other three angels. In other words, it's saying, listen, you, you thought these four were bad. You, you'd have no clue about what's yet to come. And so the first four judgments have been judgments of natural type causes that, that affect the earth. And so the next three trumpet judgments will seem to be of supernatural forces on the earth. And he says, woe to the inhabitants of the earth. Now, there are two words in the Greek language for people who live on the earth. One word means simply people who live on the earth. Well, duh, that's where people live. But the word used here refers to a certain kind of people who not only live on the earth, but they settle down and they basically love the world. You know, they, they don't not, they're not thinking about heaven. They don't think about their heavenly home. They can only think uh, about this world because it's not just their home, it's their God. And it's like what James 4.4 4 reminds us when it says friendship with the world means enmity with God. So that's what's happening. These people have friendship with the world, and so they become God's enemies. And a question I would ask at this point is, which do you want to hear? You know, do you, do you want to hear the trumpets? Are, are you willing to go through these trumpet judgment, or do you want to hear the trumpet? We talked about the trumpet several weeks ago when we talked about the rapture that I believe will happen before any of this begins. And 1 Thessalonians 4.16 tells us, The Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, and the trumpet of God will sound, and the dead in Christ will be raised first, and then we who are alive will be caught up together to meet them in the air. So one of these days, that trumpet will sound. That one trumpet will sound. And if we're saved and if we believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, we're, we're going to be raptured up to heaven. 
But those who miss the rapture trumpet will hear the trumpets of what we're reading about. So what, what's it going to be for you? I, you know, I'm, we're stopping right here in the middle of, the, of this message for just a minute to just give you a reality check. You know, I mean, this sounds like a, quite a science fiction movie I'm describing here, but I'm talking about real life if you miss the rapture. So what's it going to be for you, the trumpets or the trumpet? As soon as the angel had flown by crying, whoa, 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 for those who still survive in the earth, the first of the three woes begins. Verse 1, that we're in chapter 9, Revelation 9, verse 1, the fifth angel sounded his trump, and I saw a star that had fallen from the sky to the earth. The star was given the key to the shaft of the abyss. This is not just an ordinary star we're talking about here. This star has fallen from heaven to earth. Now that immediately gives us a clue of what the star is all about. Because I believe the star is none other than Satan himself. One of the names for Satan is Lucifer, which means brightness. He's compared to the morning star. Jesus even said on one occasion to his disciples, I saw Satan fall like lightning from heaven. Now the Greek word here, and some of your uh, translations have abyss. Some of you have the bottomless pits. But, but the word is translated abusos, where we get the word abyss. And some translations, like I would say, say bottomless pit. But the word is found nine times in the Bible, seven of which are right here in the book of Revelation. What, what is this place? What is the abyss? Well, do you remember when Jesus traveled onto the Gentile side of the Sea of Galilee? And he met, met a man who was possessed by many demons. And Jesus asked the name. And they answered legion because there are so many of them. And this is in Luke chapter 8. You can look it up later. And as Jesus prepared to cast the demons out, they became so terrified and pleaded with Jesus not to send them to the abyss. And so Jesus sent them into a nearby herd of pigs that panicked and ran down the hill into the sea where they drowned. Now, similarly, every time that we find the abyss or the bottomless pit mentioned in Scripture, it's associated with demonic forces. So we can be confident whatever goes into the abyss or whatever comes out is of demonic in nature. And I mention that because Revelation goes on to say in verse 2, when he opened the abyss, smoke rose from it like the smoke from a gigantic furnace. The sun and the sky were darkened by the smoke from the abyss. And out of the smoke locusts came down on the earth and were given power like that of scorpions of the earth. They were no, told not to harm the grass of the earth or any plant or tree, but only those people who did not have the seal of God on their foreheads. They were not allowed to kill them, but only to torture them for five months. And the agony they suffered was like that of the sting of a scorpion when it strikes, turning those days, during these days, people will seek death but not find it, they will long to die, but death will elude them. Well, there, there's a lot in here to unpack, and I'm not going to unpack all of it, because I, honestly, I don't know what to tell you about some of it. But this, this will not be like the plague of locusts that we saw in Egypt back in their plagues. Uh, the locusts at that time were directed toward the food supply and Pharaoh and his people. They were an aggravation, but they just, like most locusts, uh, you know, they will just tear apart, you, you know, whatever vegetation is in front of them. But these here were, were, were kept from, you know, the har not harming the grass or the earth or, or any plant or any tree. So these revelation locusts have to avoid all that. They'll feed on people instead. Now, they're not going to eat them up, and, and it says here they're not going to kill them. And, and the, back to the Egyptian locusts, they only stayed for days. These tribulation locusts are going to be around for five months. But the 144,000, it doesn't say that number here, but there are going to be those that, that, that were not going to be affected by this. Uh, these 144,000 witnesses for God, they're, they're not going to, they have the seal of God, so they're not going to be affected by this. And there'll be, there will be people that resent them because of that, because they're not going through that. And so, but there will be others that recognize the fact that, hey, what's different about them is they're a believer in God, and maybe many will turn to God. So there has been controversy about whether these are actual locusts. And John gets quite descriptive as he talks about them, and much of what he says is quite unlocust like So let's look at their description starting in verse 7. The locusts look like horses prepared for battle. On their heads they wore something like crowns of gold, and their faces resembled human faces. Their hair was like women's hair, and their teeth were like lion's teeth. They had breastplates like breastplates of iron, and the sound of their wings was like the thundering of many horses and chariots rushing into battle. They had tails with stingers like scorpions, and in their tails they had power to torment people for five months. They had as king over them the angel of the abyss, 
whose name in Hebrew is Abaddon, and in Greek it is Apollon, that is destroyer. So crowns, faces like men, hair like women, teeth like lions, breastplates of iron, tears like scorpions. What are these things? Now some commentators believe that John is describing modern day helicopters. And there are elements of the description that would fit there. But unless the pilot has little red horns and a ponytail, you know, this, this doesn't quite work. For one thing, if a helicopter is going to send some kind of armament at you, it's not just going to sting you and hurt you. It will kill you. Uh, remember, these locusts here didn't come from a helicopter factory. The Bible says they came from the abyss. There's no reason to allegor allegorize their origin. John said that they're demonic locusts, and, and I'm just going to believe that what he said is true. Now, one more reason to look at them as demonic creatures is the fact that they have a king leading them. He is the angel of the abyss with a very fitting name, destruction or destroyer. So five months of this horror qualifies as the first woe, but hey, there's more to come. So look at verse 12. The first woe is past, two others are yet to come. The sixth angel sounded his trumpet, and I heard a voice coming from the four horns of this golden altar that is before God. It said to the sixth angel who had the trumpet, release the four angels who are bound at the great river Euphrates. Now, the Euphrates River is well known in the Middle East, but those of us probably didn't hear much about it until Saddam Hussein invaded Kuwait in 1990. And suddenly the Euphrates River was on every newscast. And, but, you know, as readers of the Bible, we knew about it. We had heard about it in the book of Genesis, uh, that this was by the Garden of Eden. Genesis 2 says it like this, the name of the first... Uh, of these four rivers that, that exited the garden, the name was Pishon. It is the one which skirts the whole land of Havilah, where there is gold, and the gold of that land is good. Bedellum and onyx stone are also there. The name of the second river is Gihon. It is the one which goes around the whole land of Cush. The name of the third river is Hedekiel. It's the one which goes toward the east of Assyria, and the fourth river is the river Euphrates. So, these four angels have been locked there for centuries, awaiting their release. Who are they? Who are these folks? Well, I, I just have a, a little thought about that. Uh, there have been four worldwide kingdoms in history, and all four of them began right here around the Euphrates River. There were the Babylonian Empire, the Persian, the Grecian, and the Roman Empires. It's possible that these angels are the four demon princes who ruled over these empires in their time. You remember that the angel was delayed in answering Daniel's prayer, and, and, and he said, I, I was sent immediately to you, Daniel, but I was held up for 21 days fighting the prince of Persia. When he mentioned the prince of Persia, it wasn't some earthly king. This was, a, this, this was a spiritual force in high places king, the prince of Persia. So the Euphrates River also is important for other reasons. It was the region of the Euphrates that man first saw the light of day. It was here that Satan caused the fall of humanity. It was here that the first murder committed. It was here that man's first organized rebellion against God took place. The Tower of Babel was built. And with the tower, that tower, secularism, humanism, made its grand entrance into the mind of man. So it's possible that, that each of these you know, demon princes that might have ruled these four uh, empires that, that maybe on their time they were defeated by the angels of God and they, they were, you know, forced here. Now notice that these angels are not released until God gives the command, okay? So they just can't come and go. They, they are in chains. Verse 15, and the four angels who had been kept ready for this very hour and day and month and year were released to kill a third of mankind. The number of the mounted troops was twice 10,000 times 10,000, I heard their number. The horses and riders I saw in my vision looked like this. Their breastplates were fiery red, dark blue and yellow as sulfur. The heads of the horses resembled the heads of lions, and out of their mouths came fire, smoke, and sulfur. A third of mankind was killed by the three plagues of fire, smoke, and sulfur that came out of their mouths. The power of the horses was in their mouths and in their tails, for their tails were like snakes having heads with which they inflict injury. So unlike the locusts, we don't know the origin of this army. So their makeup is dependent upon speculation. Some say these could be, you know, warriors dressed up, you know, from different nations. Uh, but what we see here is that another one-third of humanity is going to be wiped out by this terrible militia. 
You know, that equates to the number of people in the billions, which makes it easy to see this could be some, some kind of demonic horde, some kind of army that they gather that's not of this world. But, but the fact is that the devastation that occurs after the sounding of the six trumpets, you, you would think humanity would be on their knees crying out for the mercy of God. You know, think, think of what they've gone through. You know, the seals and now these trumpet judgments. And, 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 but yet you think people would be just running to God. But look, look at the last two verses of Revelation. 20 and 21, chapter 9. The rest of mankind who were not killed by these plagues still did not repent. And I think you've got to be kidding me. They did not repent of the work of their hands. They did not stop worshiping demons and idols of gold, silver, bronze, stone, and wood, idols that cannot see or hear or walk. Verse 21, nor did they repent of their murders, their magic arts, their sexual immorality, or their thefts. Friends, I'm telling you, if, if, if I was going through all of that, I'm asking, where, where is the way out of this? You know, where is the way to God? But yet, they're not. And notice the kinds of sins that will still be prevalent and prominent in the last days of the tribulation. Three main kinds that we can see here that they, man, mankind will not give up. There is a sin of spiritual idolatry. The rest of mankind who were not killed by these plagues still did not repent of the work of their hands. They did not stop worshiping demons and idols of gold, silver, bronze, stone, and wood, idols that cannot see or hear or walk. So three false religion will consume the hearts of the minds of men. Humanism, the work of their hands. Satanism, that they should not worship demons. Materialism, items of gold, silver, brass, stone, and wood. So, so we see that prevalent today, do we not? Yes. So we, we're seeing the, re, uh, uh, the resurgence and emergence of some of these three religions today. Humanism has taken over you know, our public and higher education system. Satanism is on the rise. We see an increasing interest in the occult and astrology, horoscopes. Second, there's a sin of social impropriety. They did not repent of their murders. Friends, I, you, know, uh, you know, we hear about murders all the time. Constantly on the news, somebody's killing somebody. Or of their magic arts or sorceries. The word for sorceries in the Greek is the word pharmakeo, from which we get our word pharmacy. It literally means the use of drugs. D during that time of history, drugs will be you know, bargain basement prices. You can get whatever you want because people are going to be so out of it that they want to numb the pain. Or their thefts. You won't be able to trust anybody in these last days with your private property. You, nothing that you have will be safe. Everybody, if you have what they want, they will try to take it. And so all of these things are interrelated. David Wilkinson once said, I have yet to see a person worshiping devils who did not first open their minds to mystical experience through the use of drugs. And because of that, many murders are drug related. And many today are stealing and killing to pay for their drug habits. So they are connected. And then thirdly, we see that there will be the sin of sexual immorality. And the Greek word here for immorality is where we get the word pornea, from which we get the word pornography. This refers to all kinds of sexual perversion, homosexuality, bestiality, orgies, wife swapping, child molestation, rape will be seen on an unprecedented scale. Five, listen, folks, we're seeing it now. We're, 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 we're going through the birth pains of all of these things. So let me wrap this up for you. If you study the Bible, you, you find that God is totally in control of this world. You might not, it might not seem like it, but he is. But because there's evil and suffering in this world, there have been some who have tried to argue that, hey, God just doesn't exist. Look at what he lets happen. And the question is, how can a sovereign and gracious God allow evil to be in this world? How can that happen? The Greek philosopher Epicurus said, God either wishes to take away evil and is unable, or he is unable and unwilling, or he is neither willing nor able, or he is both willing and able. If he's willing but unable, he's feeble, which is not the character of God. If he is neither willing nor able, he is both resentful and feeble, and therefore not God. If he is both willing and able, which alone is suitable for God, why does he not remove evil? Now, at first, that seems to be a formidable argument. The argument goes, if there is evil in the world, it is proof that either God does not exist or he cannot do anything about it. But if he can't do anything about it, then he is not God, therefore God does not exist. What, what does it seem like God prolongs agony? Why 
safety allow this? I mean, why, why the trumpets? Why the seals? Why these woes? And, and why these bowls that are coming up? Why doesn't God just get it over with? There's a guy by the name of Dr. Joe Henry Hank, who was a preacher who lived a few generations ago. He once preached a message entitled, Who Cares If a Sinner Goes to Hell? Let me tell you who cares. God cares. God cares. Ezekiel 33, 11 says, Say to them, as I live, says the Lord God, I have no pleasure in the death of the wicked, but that the wicked turn from his way and live. Friends, we better get this as part of our heart attitude. You know, we're not going to be up in heaven cheering all those maybe people on earth that are going through their suffering that might have did us wrong, or they've just been horrible people on the world stage. That's not God's heart, and that will never be our heart. It should not be. There is one thing throughout all the revelation that never changed, and that is that God desires that none should perish. At any moment along these, he's, he's hoping that people would turn to him. So God shows us through all of these judgments that the heart of the human problem is the problem of the human heart. Man does not need reformation, rehabilitation, re-education, or reorientation. What man needs is regeneration. He needs to be saved. He needs to be born again. And the real message of this sermon is if you need to be saved, you can be saved if you want to be saved. In fact, now's a good time to be saved because none of us know when that trumpet's going to sound the Lord's going to call us home. Now, the unbelievers of the tribulation still have the option to turn to God, but as I just read, they don't. They don't repent. Their desire for sin outweighs the price they are paying. Can you believe it? But friends, we don't have to get there. We can come to Jesus right now. And I'd ask you to bow your heads and close your eyes. And if any of you do not know the Lord, you can know him now. You can begin by simply inviting Jesus into your heart to save you, to forgive you of your sins and to begin a relationship with you. Call upon him. You might hear this and you might not want to do this right now, but, but as you think about this and as you read more, you might, you might come to the realization, I need Jesus. I'm not saying just accept Jesus to, as fireproof, you know, to, to just make sure that your ticket is punched to heaven. No, if, if you do this, do it for real. Do it in a life-changing way. Do it with repentance and say, I'm not going to live the old life I've been living. I'm going to enter on the new life that Jesus has for me and, and do that and you'll be blessed. So God bless you and have a wonderful day. One more time, thank you so much for joining us at church today. If you would like to find out more about EAG, who we are, and what we do, make sure to check us out at the social media links down below. You can also go to our website, www.eagrm.org. We'd love to hear from you and get you plugged into our church family. That's all the time we've got for this week, but make sure to join us again same place, same time next week as we come back together for another great weekend of online church. We look forward to having you joining us. And so until we see each other again, stay safe, take care, and God bless. Goodbye for now.